Hey, welcome back, First Assembly of, of God, uh, to our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, I got some good news. We are going to start back on Wednesday night at the church in August. So I'll let you get some more details, and hopefully we'll, we'll still have this online. But so you know, uh, August 5th, uh, we'll start at 7 p.m., like before. Uh, we'll have a church church. We'll, 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 we will continue with the book of Mark, because we won't be through it. But tonight, you know, we are looking at the book of Mark, chapter 3. We've been learning a lot. I'm hoping you've been learning a lot. But we've been seeing, even in, even in Jesus' life, you know, the, how the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes, would come after Jesus. And, and we can kind of see what, you know, their heart. And, and tonight, we, we're going to ask you this, though. Is my personal question to you is, how, have you ever asked what makes a person's people or persons have hard hearts what causes a hard heart is it an attitude that makes us what less teachable is it uh, being less responsive and you know does a hard heart cause us to be less open to the things of the Lord have you have you ever experienced a hard heart in your personal life yourself I mean, just be honest um, there's been times my heart had been hard over some certain things and, and God had to come to me and, and correct me and God had to come to me and love on me to to show me where my heart was hardened. And that's what we'll be dealing with tonight. <clears throat> on hardness of heart. You know, sometimes uh, we can be stubborn. It's, it's just truth. You know, sometimes we dig our heels in. You know, I'm not going. Kind of like a kid. You know, I'm not going. You ever see it like a, you know, you see a parent, in a, maybe in a cartoon or a commercial, grab the kid by his hands and his heels are in. Or people who have to maybe go to the doctor or the dentist. Or like, is it like joking around? But sometimes that's our... That, that's the way we are with God, going to God. See, a hardness of heart can come upon us and it can point anyone. And and I think I think sometimes for me, when my heart becomes, I can, when I can sense my heart being hard, I have to look and say, okay, have I been reading my Bible steadily? Um, have I been talking to God? Have I been taking some time with God? Have I been praying with God? And, you know, it's hard to get back into reading if you've been away from it. And that's why, as believers, we need to be diligent in studying the Word of God. It's something that we need to do. Whether you do a chapter a day, whether you do just a little section a day and just and just dive into that. Not just the devotional. Devotionals maybe get your heart beaten in the morning, but honestly, to, to really get into the meat of the Word, to get to know who God is, and to study God's Word, we need to be in a place where we are really digging into what God has for us. Um... You know, even like, even with this coronavirus, you know, we were in shutdown. Now we see a slowness of people coming back to the church because we've, to be honest, people got comfortable where they're. They got kind of lazy. And we get that way, you know. Oh, wow, it's just nice we can see. We After we watch Pastor Mark, we can go on and watch some of the other people on TV and we can stay in our pajamas and just take it easy. And that's what happens, and then and slowly, after we take that small, that slow break, we it's like slowly coming back. And sometimes, you know, when when we just take a break from God, it's hard to coming back because we think, oh, what what are people going to say? Well, you know, are they going to look at me kind of funny? You know, sometimes we come into church and we just sit there and it's like, you know, I really don't feel like I belong here. And that's what happens when our heart starts to get hardened. If we don't keep on reading the Word and praying and surrounding ourselves with other believers, we can gain a hardened heart. Um, by nature, we really don't stay connected to God. By nature, we don't stay sensitive to God. It's not natural, but it's a supernatural to stay connected with Him. It's the Holy Spirit. We need to be careful that we don't allow a natural hardness of a heart to come to us. Okay, let's go to Matt, our book of Mark, chapter 3. We start with a man with a withered hand. You know, it's interesting we think about a withered hand. What did, what did it actually look like? I mean, was it just like all skin? You know, just hanging off? Was it just like really like, did it, you know, I know this is weird, but if you ever watch like an old, like, I remember Indiana Jones movies, and in one scene, there were, he, he opens uh, an old casket up. And, and, and it had a withered hand or withered body in it. It was a, it was, you know, it was dead for thousands of years. You know, I wonder what that withered hand looked like. And, 
It says on verse 1, it says, Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And obviously, it is the Sabbath day. We can see that the man was a plant by the religious leader to catch Jesus in some way. We know from previous chapters. Mark doesn't say this, but you can you can read into just even the scripture. Uh, hand was withered. Luke 6.6 6 says it was his right hand, which would probably have affected his ability to work. Normally, I, I think, like even today, you know, it might be more today, but a majority of people are right-handed. I had to, I'm left-handed naturally, but I had to use both hands. Uh, and, and the actress can't even pronounce words tonight. But I was able to use both hands, even with like a lot of today's tools and construction are for right-handers. So I can understand this. And it says, and they watched Jesus to see uh, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Now listen, they were watching him. It's interesting it says they watched Jesus. It was a continuous thing. It wasn't just like a one-time thing, like you're watching a TV show or just, you know, you watch something happen. It was a continual watching of him. It's kind of like stalker. They stalked Jesus to see where he's at. And the whole accusation thing goes back to see where they, he basically stood on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was, we talked a little bit last time, uh, was a huge club that the religious leaders would use to beat Jesus with. Uh, religious leaders wanted to try to prove Jesus was not true to the Sabbath and that Jesus help, helps us, though, understand what the true meaning of the Sabbath for, uh, meant. Um, it was interesting, and, and it's sad, because uh, you can see a lot of their actions today. Like, cause See, listen, they weren't really interested in that crippled man's hand. They, they weren't concerned about him. And it's kind of like a lot of, like, even today with our politics, are the leaders, and I'm not saying all of them, but all of our leaders really worry about what's going on in our lives personally, or they only worry what they can get, what they can gain. You kind of, you kind of look at, at, you can see this, the religious people here, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the, and the scribes and the people against Jesus, and you can see them, what they're doing. You can kind of relate to that today's politics and, and politicians. Uh, they wanted to catch Jesus in, in a technical violation uh, so it's to discredit him, to reject him. Uh, Jesus acted out of compassion for this man to continue to teach his disciples and to confront the, the rule-oriented, traditional, bound, self-righteous religious leaders. In verse 3 and 4 he says, And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. Now, come on, let's, let's just be honest whether the man knew this was a setup or he just went there because he wanted to see Jesus. Think about this. You have a withered hand, you have no use of that hand, and Jesus says, hey, come here. And you knew that you had a, a great a great chance, or not chance, like you were going to get healed, no matter if it was the Sabbath. Wouldn't you run to him to get healed? And he said to them, and he said to them is it lawful to, on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. It's funny, this, it's funny when you really think about this, and you kind of wanted to see their faces, is why didn't the religious leaders uh, want to answer Jesus? Listen, they were trying to get Jesus to respond incorrectly. Their thoughts were a true man of God would not work on a Sabbath. But Mark, Mark shows no reply. But Matthew did write it down. It says in Matthew chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, it says this. And he said to them, Which one of you has a sheep and it falls into the pit on the Sabbath? Would not take hold of it and lift it up. How much more value is the man than the sheep? So is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Now, Jesus gives an answer, but here's the problem. God gave the Sabbath to the Jews as a day of rest. The Jews, now listen, the Jews added to God's word with all kinds of rules, regulations. Jesus reminded them that the true meaning of, uh, and the, the meaning and the Jews have valued the Sabbath over the people, and they became legalistic. The rabbis had, had highly developed a oral tradition in the Talmud, which interpreted in the Mosaic Law, they made a rigid pronouncement on what could legally be done or not be done on the Sabbath. They added to it. Uh, it was interesting. One example that I find was one could stabilize an injured person in an emergency on the Sabbath by their rules, but could not improve his condition. And Jesus' question revealed the problem of the priority of their, their cherished tradition above human need. This is true above this is true about all legalistics. Here's a man with some sort of deformity of the hand, and Jesus was compassionate and, and, and God moved in the face of 
the crowd of hard-hearted people who, who would think it's wrong to do good for someone on the Sabbath, and he was healed. He was restored. And it says in verse 5, And he looked around at them with anger and greed that the hardness of their heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Mind blown. I think it would have been cool to just see that thing come back. All the, like, muscles grow and the, and the tendons and all everything attached. And, like, the guy goes like this after all. You know, I think that would have been pretty cool to see. But could you imagine seeing this person and hearing others complain about this because he was healed? Well, wait a minute. How dare you, Jesus? It's the Sabbath. And you healed this man. Couldn't he have waited another day? I mean, that's how people think. I'm like, no, why should he? I'm here. I can, you know, Jesus is saying, I'm here. I can, it's, it's done. Boom. You know, we, we, we sometimes point out that out there, we look at the people and say, you know, what angers God? But in verse 5, it talks about the hardness of heart. Can a Christian have a hardness of heart? Have I grieved? the Holy Spirit or even, even if God have I grieved God at any time you know sometimes hardness of heart sneaks into our lives unnoticed that's something we need to be careful of you know hey look the guy gets healed on a Sunday praise God but if he gets healed during the rest of the week praise God too it shouldn't matter it, 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 he was just saying listen guys guys I want you to get this and it goes on in verse 6 and says, The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him and how to destroy him. <laughs> because he healed a man on one of their sacred roles. Wow, that's amazing. <clears throat> that's, that's, that's amazing. You know, We want to kill God because we, he healed somebody and broke one of their traditions. Their traditions, not him. Remember, Jesus never sinned. Now verse 7 says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea and a great crowd followed him to Galilee and Judea. Jesus' growing popularity was another reason for the opposition from religious leaders. Listen, religious leaders like to be paid attention to. They put their fancy robes on. They say, look at me. Hey, I'm closer to God than you. And they like the attention. They like the accolades. They like the praise. And Jesus is like, that's not what you're here for. You're here to spread the word. And a great number of people. Now, I look at that. I look at, at, at um, and it says a great crowd followed him. Now, I'm thinking there's probably a mixture of Jews and Gentiles following. I don't think they're just all Jews. And it says in verse eight in Jerusalem, in Adumiah, and from beyond the Jordan, through the Tyre and Sidon, when the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. Now, like, Jesus would do this. Uh, he would jump in a boat and pull off shore just a little bit away so he could talk and be more effective to people who, who came to him. And people weren't, like, all jammed in. And you ever get, like, I don't know, I can remember sometimes riding a bus, and not a school bus, but, like, a public transportation, and people were all jammed together. Not cool. So Jesus made it away so that people weren't all jammed up. It says for in verse ten, it says for he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. Pressing around him literally means falling against him. Can you imagine all the people? Listen, Jesus, I need you. I need you to heal me. I need you to, to touch. Let me just touch you. You know, I can remember the woman with the issue of blood. I mean, what she did to get to Jesus. She pushed through the crowd. She pushed through the embarrassment, and she grabbed a hold of his hand because she knew that when she do it, boom, he was going to do it. Every sick person wanted to touch him, and the crowd looked like. It, you, get, you get a sense of this when you see the crowd it looked like almost like a, a waiting room at the hospital the emergency room you know when you walk in and something just happened boom all these people were waiting for G Jesus and whenever the unclean spirit saw him they fell down before him and he cried, and cried out you are the son of God now unclean spirit we know that demonic spirit and he strictly ordered them not to make him known why? because there was a timing remember we talked about it was God's timing but it was interesting, though, when Jesus did cast out, it was amazing because he just said the word, and it was done. Where there was no fancy words, no fancy prayers, no oils, no nothing. It was boom. Jesus walked up and did it. The twelve disciples, we're going to talk about that now. Verse 13 says, When he went up to the mountain, he called to them who he desired, and he came to them. 
And he appointed twelve, who also named apostles, so that they might, might be with him, and he might send them out to preach, and have authority to cast out demons. So you know what? what he's, listen, I did it, now you're going to have the ability to do it through him. And in the scripture, Jesus calls them to, uh, to do a description of the word apostle, one sent forth with authority or sent one. He pointed 12, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. Verse 17, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name of Bonages, that is, the sons of thunder. Remember the sons of thunder? These guys were a handful. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, do you ever ask yourself this question, though, is, is that they were all apostles, and but you don't hear much about them. I wonder what happened. You know, you ever think about it? Even, like, go on your own personal study. Bartholomew. We don't hear too much about him. Um, Thaddeus. Um, you know, we know Andrew, but we don't, you know, what did these guys do? I think of Judas, and I know we would know he betrayed Jesus, but did, did, did he, everything he do, did everything was it bad? Was he totally corrupt? Was it a leading? You know, Jesus, he, he, Jesus even chose Judas, where a lot of people who were following Jesus were on, on a regular basis, there were a lot more. Some believe that Judas, no, this is, some believe Judas was a, it was born just to be a betrayer. That Judas was predestined to betray Jesus all along and had no choice. He had to fulfill a destiny. I, I don't, I don't believe that G, Judas uh, didn't have a choice to say you know, or repent. You know, I don't, I don't believe that. That um, would that be really fair? Think about it. You're predestined to betray the Savior and, and spend eternity in hell. You know, there's there's even a school of the, thought out there that there are people who are predestined for heaven and some predestined for hell. I mean, what happened in the scripture in Romans 10 and 13, it says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, I, I mean, watch what, you, what, watch what you read out there, but Jesus knew from the beginning, Judas, beginning, Judas was one of the one, but I don't believe that uh, God's foreknowledge on the matter dictates the outcome. God sees everything, no matter, he sees from the beginning to the end. Judas had free choice, my heart. He chose not to change his life or soften his heart towards God. You know, can you remember he criticized Mary as she anointed Jesus? Remember he chose 30 pieces of silver for, for Jesus? I don't believe Judas was created to suffer in hell. I believe he chose. Like a lot of people out there, like, the gospel's a free gift. It's given to everyone who wants to choose it. You know, a lot of people say, I can't believe God sends people out. We don't. We send ourselves. We choose not to, to take that free invitation. In verse 20 it says, And when he went home and the crowds gathered and they could not even eat. And when, and when his family heard of it, they went out to seize him for they were saying, He's out of his mind. Now, so you, this is, you know, so you know, he says he went home to his family. Now, some different denominations say family was other people in the, of the Lord. You know, brothers and sisters of the Lord, meaning it's like you and I. Um, but the, the Greek can be translated as brothers and sisters, like siblings. So they'd be half brothers and half sisters. Uh, Mary and Joseph had kids after Jesus was born. Uh, they had a normal marriage. It was it was normal. Um, they they you know. I don't think that Joseph and um, Mary stayed celibate the rest of their lives. That would go against God's word. Remember, be fruitful and multiply. Um, that's what marriage is for. One become one flesh. So, uh, for me, uh, they had kids. They had step. So Jesus had step brothers and step sisters. Um, and there's uh, there are some denominations that say that that um, Mary stayed pure. She didn't have no physical contact with Joseph. For me, that's to me is a form of hardness of heart for those who believe this. That's just that's just weird. Matthew 10 says this, verse 36 through 39. The person's enemies will be will be those of his own household. Because it's interesting because he says this. He's out of his mind. Did they know who Jesus really was at that time? Hey, you're out of your mind, man. 
But whoever loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves the son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will, will find it. It's hard to, to live in a divided home or even a marriage. You know, I experienced that myself personally in my family. That there was a time that my house was divided because where my walk was. I, I wanted to serve God and they would say, you're out of your mind. You know, you're crazy. You, what are you talking about? And, you know, are we living for Jesus? See, we will deal with opposition with family and friends. And Jesus' family seemed to be against him. He's out of his mind. Jesus didn't got, he didn't get caught up in all this drama. You know? Okay, now we're going to talk about a touchy subject tonight. Blasphemy and against the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm sure that if you're watching, you probably have your own idea of what blasphemy and the Holy Spirit is. So let's break this down and go through. Verse, or verse 22 of Mark 3. It describes who came down from Jerusalem, or saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub. And the prince of demons, he casts out demons. Now, Jewish... This is just another thing the Jewish leaders adopted for Satan or Satan's cohorts. But Beelzebub... Um, there's Bob and Baal. Its name is Satan, um, chief of evil spirits. The name Beelzebub is associated with the Canaanite god Baal. And, the, uh, and in theological sources, predominantly Christian Beelzebub, sometimes meaning for the devil, or Satan describes Beelzebub as capable of flying, known as the Lord of the Flyers or Lord of the Flies. A pagan Philistine god worshipped an ancient Philistine city of Ekron during the Old Testament times. It's, this term signifies the Lord of the Flies. Second Kings, you can look at that one up. Uh, the word has two parts. Baal, which is the name of a Canaanite fertility gods in the Old Testament, and Zebul, which means exalted dwelling. Think about what did Satan want to do? He wanted to exalt himself, his, his equal with God. Uh, some biblical scholars believe that Beelzebub was known as the god of the filth, which later became the name of bitter scorn in the mouth of the Pharisees. As a result, Beelzebub was a particularly contemptible deity, and his name was used uh, as a character for Satan, uh, epithet for Satan. They couldn't say anything uh, wasn't happening here because when um, when someone was uh, when someone was even when in a possession, when when someone was possessed by a demon, um, and when Jesus came and he left. Uh, people's countenance would change. It was innocent, but they kept on accrediting that to Satan and not to God. You know, it's interesting. But he says this, and he says in verse 23, He called to him, he said to them in parables, how, how can Satan cast out Satan? If the kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself, and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one, it says, can enter a strong man's house and plunder the goods unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. You know, it's interesting, we don't necessarily see the byproduct of life after possession you know, when someone is set free. But they saw these people... When, when people were possessed, they saw these people was whacked out, maybe crazy, going nuts, going nuts. But one minute they were they were crazy, and in one minute they're joyful and sane in the next. So, so Jesus asked them, okay, what's Satan's MO? Motive operandi. What was to bind people, destroy their lives, and then use this the power of Satan to free them from the bondage he just put them in? You see the dilemma there. It, it doesn't make sense. And it was just like, even like today when you watch some of the news, you know, it just does not make sense some of the things they're saying. He's saying, so you're saying that I'm using the power of Satan to set them free from his bondage and possession and giving them life. What is in common here is the power and authority that Jesus exercised versus the, remember I mentioned earlier, the magical potions and the formulas that they used by these rabbis. Jesus clearly shows that his coming Satan was already defeated. He could not. 
He could not stop Jesus from doing what Jesus wanted to do. Satan, that is. And he goes on and says, Truly I say to you, in verse 28, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemy they utter. But, that conjunction, three letter, whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal sin. So you notice a difference there between 28 and 29. Now these verses have challenged and frightened many believers and many people for years. Now understand, unless otherwise noted in this chapter, was about the whole thing is about hardness of heart. If you notice, if you go all the way back to even verse 1, where they start to challenge Jesus about healing the, um, the man with a withered hand on the, on the Sabbath, remember? And then, well, there was a, there was a point that they picked his 12 disciples. And then he goes into the blasphemy of the, of the Spirit. Now, remember, hardness of heart. What causes the hardness of heart? Now, listen. The religious leaders, right off the bat, Jesus must die. Why? Because he healed a man on the Sabbath. There, there, there's a heart of heart. His own family said, this man is out of his mind. There's a, there's a hardness of heart. There's, a, there's something going on in their own hearts. And the religious leaders see Jesus set a man free. And he saves from, from demonic possession. And then they tell everybody, Jesus did this under the power of the devil. The level of hardness of heart should get our attention here. When a level of hardness of heart goes so far that it cannot be reached by the word of God, there is no turning back. Through time, you can see people who have hardness of heart. Because it says in verse 30, For they were saying, He has an unclean spirit. They were giving credit of the work of God's Holy Spirit to Satan. Blasphemy of this Holy Spirit is this. Witnessing the power of God being displayed through the person of Jesus Christ and creating that power to work. Accrediting, I'm sorry. Crediting that power to the work of of the enemy for deception purposes and confusion. Do you, do you see what they were doing? Do you see how they were manipulating? And you see how they and, 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 and listen, nobody nobody does this by accident. This is on purpose. They, they, they seen the power of God being displayed right in front of them trying to discredit Jesus even with the withered hand and then they give, the, they credit the power of the work of God God's Holy Spirit to say, to just just to give deception and trip people up and give confusion. It's amazing the way that the Pharisees and their tactics were trying what they were doing. Kind of reminds me, it's going to be bad, kind of reminds you of some political parties that we see out there today. They take something with deception, make confusion, and everybody's like, they don't know what to believe, and this is what's going on here. Nobody does this by accident. It's all done on purpose. They purposely did this. Only a person with such a hardened heart and doesn't care that they had did it. They don't care. They have no concern. They had no concern about what they were doing to people's lives. Do you think, honestly, let's be honest, let's go to the political place. Do you really think the people who are causing all this turmoil out in our country today care whether you live or survive? Or do you think they're more worried about their purpose and their agenda? Kind of reminds you of the, of, the, of the leaders back then that Jesus was facing. Why is this sin unforgivable? Blasphemy in the Holy Spirit. To understand that, you must understand the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. What is His role? Remember, at your conversion, you and I were shown that, that our sin placed Jesus Christ on the cross. That is, the Holy Spirit is doing what He does in order for us to be saved. He has to do this work. John 16, verse 7 says, we'll go through 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the help will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send Him to you. Remember, this is Jesus preparing to go. And he said, listen, the Holy Spirit is coming. And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in Me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler, because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, when I was first a believer, um, 
you know, when, when you're from, to me, this is my personal, when, I don't know how it affected you, but when I became a believer, I knew I was convicted of the sin in my life. And to me, that was proof that the Spirit of God is inside of me. But as I was a young Christian, there would be times that the enemy would speak things into my ear. And and you and you and, and I begin to ask, you know, have I committed? Because that 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 kind of scares you to really think about if you if you blast me against the Holy Spirit. Um, I mean that's that's tough. That's eternal. That I man tells you right there is it's separation from God. But it, it, it to me it kind of frightened me because have I done this? Have I done this? And someone wants to me, put their arm around me, and said, listen. If you're worried about it, you didn't do it. Because it's something that's purposely done. The heart has been so hard, so seared against the work of God. And that's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were displaying. That they were giving honor and glory to Satan, causing disfusion, confusion among people, and not giving the glory and honor to God when it was a miracle. What happens when a heart is so hard? How, you know, Think about this. When your heart is so hard towards God, how can they be convicted of sin? You know, because you're not even hearing the Spirit of God. So many people resist His Holy Spirit. Acts 7, verses 51. Skip down to 59 and 60. says, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in the heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. If you jump down to uh, verse 59, it says, And they were stoning Stephen. He called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knee, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold their sin against them, or this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Maybe he passed, he died. Um, you know, you can see where Stephen's heart was so sold out for God. And then you can see where they were like, how can a heart get so hard that way towards God? And you see Stephen's heart so tender towards the Lord. Stephen had a tender tender heart for God and for people. It's just, it's just true. Um, let me give you, let me jump back because I did not tell you this one thing. There is another school of thought with blasphemy and the Holy Spirit. This one's not the one. I don't believe the one that I'll, the next one is not the one I believe in. The one is that we that what I feel that. Um, Blessing the Holy Spirit is that they were giving credit to the work. They were giving credit of the work of God's Holy Spirit to Satan. And they were causing this confusion. And their hearts were so hard. It's when it, they witnessed the power of God being displayed through the person of Jesus Christ. And they credited that power to the work of the enemy for deception purposes for confusion. Something that was intentions of their heart. It was a motive thing. They they purposed to do this. Um, they didn't consider They didn't care. They were only worried about their 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 accolades from people. They wanted people to praise him. But there is another school of thought out there that says, now there are some who consider blasphemy the Holy Spirit just the rejection of salvation. Uh, I'm not one of them. Uh, they feel that the unpardonable sin is not is not a rejection of, of God by God because of some simple act or word, but a continual ongoing rejection of God in Christ by willful unbelief. Um, uh, this sin can only be committed by those who have been exposed to the gospel but those who have heard the message by Jesus clearly are most responsible for its rejection. Um, this is especially true by modern cultures that they have continual access to the gospel, but they reject Jesus. Um, there's two different schools of thought there, but mine is even explained. It's a hardness of heart. It's it's giving credit to Satan what God had did. And then let's just wrap up this chapter real quickly, verse 31 through 35. But do, do yourself a favor. Go back and restudy. And, and when we meet up next, we can have, we can have a total review and, and talk things out, what you feel and what, you know. And we can pull scriptures. It's great. But it's fun. I like, I like talking about different subjects. Uh, Jesus' mother and brothers, it says in, in your scripture, says, verse 31, it says, And his mother and his brothers came standing outside, and they, and they sent to him, and they called him. And the crowd was sitting around him, and they said, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, and he says, Who are uh, my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, said, Here are my mother and my brothers. 
For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now, reminder that he is speaking to the fam his family, not the natural family, but the spiritual family here. That, you know, me and you are not flesh flesh and blood. We're not we're not related. I mean, unless you're like one of my siblings watching, but we know he's talking spiritual family. We're, we're both we're found both found in Christ. We're born again. We're Holy Spirit filled. We're grafted into the vine as in John. Um, we're, we're family and. He's emphasizing this. He says, because, you know, sometimes our natural, you know, I mentioned this before, we're not, a, we may or may not, depending on you, like, I'm probably closer to more of my spiritual family, the born again, the, the believers in Christ, than I am closer to my natural family. Not that I don't have a relationship with my natural family, and I do. But sometimes I think we see ourselves, we see each other on a weekly basis. Sometimes we don't see our families for months or months, or maybe years, depending on your family. But that's chapter 3. Just a quick review. Uh, Jesus talks to them about their hardness, their heart, right off the bat, about healing a man. You know, um, sometimes even our lives like this, we get upset when we see someone else get blessed in their lives, and, and we don't. We, we need to be careful that we don't have a heart, get that hardness of heart. We should get excited when someone else gets blessed um, and, and to see their lives made whole. I mean, I can imagine that guy had the use of that hand. And I imagine it didn't, like, it didn't, like, stay that way. I imagine it was, it was fully functioning hand. And when Jesus spoke, he shows his authority once again. And we can see that, 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 that you know, don't get tripped up in, in old religious traditions. You know, it, it, don't, don't get tripped up with or caught up with the old ways of doing things, because that's what man does. God, God was trying to show him. Listen, you know, I'm here to, and this man is set free. Now this man's whole. He says, I'm, you know, we'll move on. I want to go on a rabbit trail. But he's seen their anger. He's seen, and he was grieved about it. And then he, we see that Jesus was. People were coming to hear to see Jesus, and and they were getting upset because a great number of people were coming to to hear what Jesus had to say. And they weren't crowding up to go see what the, the religious um, the religious leaders had to say. So he was in, 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 from the Jordan and Tyre and Sidon. He was going all around. But Jesus was making a way so that he could share with God what God's word. And it, it was interesting that they, they came after him so much. They fell against him. And every sick person wanted him to touch him. Can you imagine the things that we don't see in the scripture that Jesus had did? Because not everything he did was written in there. But enough was. <clears throat> and that even the unclean spirit knew Jesus was. And we went through, Jesus picked the twelve apostles and each one. And, and I challenge you to go back and, you know, look at some commentaries. Look at Google and see, okay, what did each of these guys do? What legacy did they leave behind? And we talked about Judas not being forced or not predestined but yet Judas had a choice and each of us have a choice too each of us do have a choice to serve God or not to serve God and then we talked about blasphemy and the Holy Spirit and I told you my, my thoughts uh, what, the, what the scripture means talk a little bit about Baal, Beelzebub uh, but this is some things you can learn and, and, and study on your own and Jesus pointedly says how does Satan stand up against himself he can't, he's, if he's divided and so you know like I said blasphemy Holy Spirit how hard can your heart be so seared that you don't even want to hear the word of God or voice of God or even, even hear his Holy Spirit I know sometimes we get distracted by things in life and not hear the Holy Spirit but don't let your heart be hardened that you don't hear the Holy Spirit and, and, and celebrate when the Holy Spirit moves in your life Amen and then we talked like, like at the end uh, Jesus brothers and sisters and Jesus plays and says look you do the will of the Father you're my brother you're my sister you're my mother so let's pray Father I thank you for your word tonight and Lord I ask Lord that your spirit would continue to be with us breathe life unto us and Lord help us not to, to grieve the Holy Spirit Father but let us hear him and, and listen to what you have to say and let our hearts always be soft and tender towards you even even when we get persecuted like Stephen he's being stoned he's being killed and yet he says Lord don't hold it against them. Forgive them. 
I want that heart. I want to have a heart like that. Father, just breathe. Breathe on all of our hearts. And Lord, maybe our hearts have been a little bit hard. Father, I pray, Lord, you would breathe on those hearts. Soften their hearts, Lord, that they would come to know you, Father, even more and more and more, Father. I ask that you would be with each one who is listening and who is watched, Lord, that you would continue to pour out your spirit in their lives, Lord. Open doors and close doors. And Father, let your spirit just reside in and just continually nurture us and lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Be blessed, and Lord willing, we'll see you next week. And keep in mind, August 5th, we are going to continue to have our Wednesday night services. So enjoy. Be blessed. Have a good evening.